Welcome to Event Supervisor Training. Uh, the information and tips contained in this video come from lessons learned over the years and much more experienced event supervisors. Uh, the information in this video is based on the 2017 rules for Scrambler. Much of the information here can be used for similar events. Scrambler is an event where the students must design and build a device to transport an egg quickly towards a barrier and stop as closely as possible to the barrier. If you want more detailed information on the event, then read the rules. This video is not a substitution for reading the rules. Don't forget about the frequently asked questions and rule clarifications posted on the Science Olympia website. Frequently asked questions are questions asked by a team to get a better understanding of what is meant by a rule. The clarifications are corrections to a rule. You should have a copy of all frequently asked questions and clarifications for your event with you at the tournament. Several teams every year are unaware of these and having a hard copy helps explain why you are interpreting a rule different than they are. Okay, let me give you your first tip. Read the rules. Now this may sound silly or redundant, but as an event supervisor you need to know the rules better than the students. As a supervisor, you will be tested by the students and the coaches, meaning you will have situations where there are discussions about different opinions of the rules, meaning I highly recommend reading the rules again the night before the tournament. Okay, we're going to start a checklist here for Scrambler and keep building on it as we go. Let's cover the first few items on it. Rules, a hard copy, frequently asked questions, and last, reread the rules. Let's talk about the event area or room where you'll be running your event. Here is one of my favorite layouts. There are many different layouts that you can use, but they all have common areas. First is the track area, which is obviously the most important area, and needs to be selected first. You need to select a long, flat, smooth area for the track or tracks. The second area is the check-in area. This is where teams bring their devices for impound and check-in during their time slots. Pre-run checks are performed at the check-in area before moving to the track. The third area is impound. All devices are checked in before the first time slot and stored in the impound area. Students may not freely retrieve their devices from impound. The last is the area for the spectators, and many times this is forgotten. Like most build events, this event is open to the public. You should plan for an area where students, coaches, and parents can watch. This should be an area where the spectators can see, but don't interfere with the students coming and going. Remember when looking at your event setup to include the flow of students. By planning a clear path for the students to come and go, your event will move more smoothly. Having bottlenecks where the students have to wait and walk around each other will cause delays in your event operation. To help create this flow, I highly recommend a roll of caution tape. Use this tape to mark off the area and create an entrance to the event where you want the entrance to be. In the excitement caused by the competition, students, coaches, and parents will walk all over your event unless you provide some method to restrict their access. Let's take a detailed look at the track area. There are several key factors that must be looked at when selecting a track area. First is the required space for a track. You may need two tracks depending on the number of teams. I recommend not exceeding five teams per track per time slot, and five teams can be very difficult depending on the team's level of experience. Teams with more violations can take longer to run. The track dimensions are well defined in the rules. Remember to include extra space around the starting area. Some teams will have a container for transporting their devices and tools. The lane boss needs room to move around the devices for inspection. If you have two tracks, space will be needed for the teams to move around each other. These are all important items for a smooth running event. Floor space is the second key factor. I have found many areas where the space was large enough, but had issues with the floor. Here is a large area. Closer inspection found several holes in the floor. Here's another area with a nice smooth floor. Again, closer inspection found metal raised ridges at the joints. When inspecting a possible floor, find the issues with the floor first. Then you should find a track path that avoids the issues with the floor. Gyms are very good areas as is the floor is smooth. Watch out for warped boards, uneven boards, 
and metal plates in the floor. I've used hallways several times. The main issues with hallways are the flow and spectators. Getting teams from impound and check-in can be difficult in tight hallways. Tight hallways also make finding space for the spectators a challenge. Remember, if you need two tracks, then both tracks need to be the same. Teams always have a choice of which of the two tracks to run on. A team must be given the option if they ask for a track. I recommend picking a direction that makes setting up the track easy. For example, having a track direction the same as the floorboards or tiles makes putting the track lines down easier. Let's continue building the checklist. One, figuring out how many tracks you need. One or two, very important. The event area, again, we want to look at the general area here. Do you have the tracks, the size, the floor is acceptable? You've got the impound area, the check-in area. You've got a spot for spectators, and let's not forget flow. And lastly, let's make sure there's AC power nearby. Let's talk about the impound area. The reason devices are impounded is because the distance for the day is announced after all the devices are impounded or at the start of the first time slot. This prevents students from modifying their devices for the distance before it is their turn. For the impound area, you just need a large area. You need to include space between the rows for the students to retrieve their devices. These rows need to be wider than the devices to protect the surrounding devices. Remember, it is the event supervisor's responsibility to protect the devices in the impound area. Accidents happen, but you need to do everything possible to protect the devices. I strongly recommend assigning an adult to watch teams storing and retrieving their devices. This helps prevent dangerous actions before damage can happen. Having to explain to a team that they cannot compete because a device was destroyed while in your impound will ruin a lot of people's day. You need to have a plan that your helpers understand before the first device is stored with an impound. Here's a typical storage layout for a basketball court. Remember to mark off the area to restrict access to impound. Classrooms work very well for impound because access is restricted because of a door. Only one way in and out. It is a very large violation to not have a device impounded before the first time slot. You need to have a type of method to record which teams have impounded. A good practice is to always assign an adult to impound. As teams store their devices, their name and or number can be checked off a list. You need to have a good method to record the impound process. I recommend no device inspection should take place during the impound. The rules allow any of the 15-member team to impound a device. You could be asking a student that has no knowledge about the device to handle it, and this is a very dangerous situation. No teams are allowed to work on their device inside impound. All work must be done before entering impound. This slows down impound and puts the surrounding devices in harm's way. I recommend telling a team that all work must be done before they store their device inside impound. I have a very important warning about impound and the competition. Never, never touch a team's device. If a team's device needs to be moved, I recommend not moving it. Only the students should touch their own device. There are too many reasons here to list why you should never handle or touch a team's device. To have a well-run event, you need to have enough helpers. How many people do you need? Well, let's cover the different roles first. Impound. Again, this person is responsible to record teams as they impound and to protect the devices inside impound. Check-in. The check-in person will perform the initial checks for each team during their time slot. Typically, the event supervisor will handle this role. This allows the supervisor to watch the flow of the entire event and answer questions as they may arise. Lane Boss. This person will manage everything taking place on the track. This includes inspections on the track, the team's time, and completing the score sheet with any violations. Each track will need its own Lane Boss. Track Timers. It is highly recommended to have three track timers. These timers will manually measure the device's time on the track. If your event has two tracks, the same timers can time both tracks. Measurer. 
This person will measure the device's distance from the target. If two tracks, the measurer does both tracks. Entering scores. This person will enter the scores into the spreadsheet to calculate the overall results. How many people do you need? That depends on the number of teams competing. A large event? I highly recommend a person for every role listed. Smaller events can have less people with the same person doing more than one role. Please keep in mind that these are suggestions. You can assign your helpers as what you see best. While impound is taking place, you want to set up the track or tracks. Let's discuss what supplies you need to set up the track. Tape. The rules want tape approximately 2.5 centimeters. I recommend using the 0.94 inch painter's tape for all lines because it is easy to find. There are different brands of this tape. Be careful some of them are very difficult to write on or see your marks on. I purchased different colored tapes to help distinguish the different lines. For example, lane versus timing lines. If you have cables or extension cords, then you should tape these down to prevent trip hazards. Remember, as the event supervisor, it is your responsibility to protect the floor from damage. Do not use duct tape. I only use painter's tape to avoid the risk of damage to the floor. You need a metric tape measure that is at least 12 meters long. Don't use a tape measure with inches and feet and try and convert to meters. I recommend using a metal metric tape measure if you can. The cloth or fabric tape measures work, just be careful not to stretch the distance by pulling too hard. I recommend bringing more than one tape measure as a backup. Meter sticks are very helpful. The shorter ones help with the check-in and the ready-to-run checks. A square. This is optional, but it does help make sure the lines are square to each other. Knee pads. Again, optional, but it does make setting up the track a lot easier. When putting the tape on the floor, typically you start with the track width lines. The tracks required width should be measured as the inside to inside edge of the tape. This is important. There is a competition violation for the vehicle's wheels touching the track width lines. Once you have both track width lines, then measure and mark the distances for the other lines. You will need tape lines for 0.5 meters, 8.5 meter timing lines, and it is important that both of these lines use the same edge, trailing or leading edge. I have seen confusion among helpers when the same edge is not used for all lines. For the start point, the rules state how this point is marked. The start point is a point in the middle of a defined piece of tape. Here is how it should look when you're done. You will need a terminal barrier for each track. This needs to span the entire width of the track. The rules give the required barrier dimensions. It is important that the barrier be smooth and straight over its entire length. Mark the track width lines with the location of the terminal barrier. You will need to remove the barrier to clean up broken eggs. And it is important that the barrier return to the same location. The barrier should also have some weight or other method to prevent movement when struck by the egg and its vehicle. A five gallon bucket. This needs to be at the halfway point between the start point and the terminal barrier. It is in the center of the track. The location of the bucket on the track needs to be marked. Teams can ask for the bucket to be removed during their setup. And if the bucket is hit, the bucket needs to be returned to the same position. Remember during the impound process, the competition distance is not to be released to the teams. Not until after all devices are impounded or the start of the first time slot. Only then should the distance be posted. With that in mind, you should not put the bucket or terminal barrier on the track until after the distance is posted. It is important not to give any teams a competitive advantage by releasing the competition distance early. The check-in area and process is the next area we will cover. How you allow teams to check in during their time slot is your choice. I typically use the schedule provided by the tournament director. This sheet lists the teams for each time slot. I then call the teams in the order as listed on the sheet. During the check-in process, a series of inspections take place. But before you start these inspections, the check-in person should start a team checklist 
for the team being checked in. This checklist was created by the national group to help make competitions run smoothly. You can find this team checklist on the event page on the Science Olympia website. You should have one copy for each team at the competition, plus some spares. Team number, school name, and student names must be filled in on the team checklist first. This checklist will follow the students through the event and is used to determine their score. The checklist is organized with the rules on the left-hand side for reference. The right side is where the results of the rule and or inspection is recorded. For yes and no questions, the wording for these will appear unusual, and you may need to read the yes and no questions more than once. Basically, if there is no violation, then the question is answered with a yes. The reason for this will be explained later. Just remember that many of the inspections require the device to be in the ready-to-run configuration, and these inspections cannot be checked at this time. The inspection of the backstop and verifying the mass of the falling mass should be done during check-in. A scale that can measure the falling mass with accuracy is required. This means a bathroom scale is not acceptable. I recommend a scale that measures no more than 15 kilograms. Remember to measure only the parts that contribute to the falling mass, which usually means the drive strings do not get measured. The backstop has several items to check. I recommend using this diagram from the Scrambler page on the national website. This is very helpful to point out issues with the team's backstop. These checks are very important because a team could obtain a competitive advantage through several methods if the backstop rules are not satisfied. It's also a very good idea to perform these checks before the egg is attached. The practice log should be verified at this time. Remember, the practice log needs to be impounded. There are penalties if the practice log was not impounded or is not completed. As the event supervisor, you need to provide number two unsharpened pencils to the teams. The pencils can be supplied to the students during the inspection or at the track by the lane boss. Just remember to get the pencils back before the students leave the area, or your event could be out of pencils quickly. The last thing a team should do before leaving the check-in area is select an egg. The teams are allowed to inspect and select their own egg. The event supervisor does not select the egg for the students. After selecting an egg, the students are responsible to protect the egg. An egg broken for any reason from this point forward is a competition violation. Teams attach the egg during the 8 minute run time. As the event supervisor, you can adjust these policies for your competition. For competitions early in the season, I will allow teams to pick a second egg if dropped, attach the egg before the 8 minute run time. I do this because students are nervous for the first time and we want them to compete and learn. Any decisions on how the event will run must be made before the first team competes. All teams must compete under the same conditions and rules. Once teams are done with check-in, they move to the track. If there's no open track, have the team wait in a holding area. Remind the team that no work is allowed while waiting for a track. When a team moves to a track, just have them move their device and tools to the track start area. Again, no work is to start yet. At this point, the lane boss gives what we call the talk. This talk is a brief explanation of how the event is run and a reminder of a few rules. The first item is to point out the distance, and I mean point out. The distance should be posted on the track, and the lane boss should point to the distance. Don't say the distance. As I was taught, this prevents there being a misunderstanding about the distance for the event. This is a practice that all your event helpers should use. Again, always point to a posted distance is my recommendation. Second item of the talk is to point to the start point. Don't assume the students know where that point is. I have seen teams set up on the half meter timing line. The third item is the eight minute run time. This is a reminder that the students have eight minutes to get both of their runs in and how the lane boss will run the time. Explain to the team that when they are ready to run, to let the lane boss know and step away from their device. Students new to the event sometimes think they are to release the vehicle when they are ready. That is why it is important to remind them and explain how this works. 
Here's an example of the talk I give for this event. The distance to the terminal barrier is posted here. This is your start point. You have eight minutes to complete both your runs. I will let you know how much time is left throughout your run. When you're ready to run, do not launch your vehicle. Let me know and I will stop your eight minute timer. At this point, we will do our ready to run checks on your device. Remember, launching your vehicle before we are ready is a failed run, which is not good. Keep your eye protection on at all times. Do you have any questions before we get started? Make sure to answer any questions the students have. The more experienced teams will ask questions throughout their time to make sure there is no violation in their setup or violations caused by their actions. Once all questions have been answered, the 8 minute timer starts when you tell the team their time starts now. For the 8 minute timer, a stopwatch will work. I prefer a countdown timer app on a smartphone. This prevents the lame boss from doing math to convert to how much time is left. Most students only care about the time left, not time used. While the students are setting up their device, just watch and let them know how much time is left. The 8 minute timer runs as long as the students are working on their device. Even if they say they're ready, remind the students that they need to stop working on their vehicles if this happens. Once the team says they are ready to run, have them back away from their device. This is when the lane boss starts the ready to run checks. These checks include verifying the overall size of the device, is the tip of the egg over the start point, did the students leave any alignment devices on the track, and several more. Remember not to touch the device while making your checks. The lane boss should look underneath the vehicle to know what is touching the floor. Any additional items touching the floor after the start is a competition violation. Record the results of these checks on the team checklist. The lane boss should read through the team checklist several times before the competition to know when the different checks are to be performed. Once the checks are complete, the lane boss should make sure the timers are ready. If you have two tracks, only one vehicle should run at a time. Once the track is ready, tell the students they can start the vehicle by giving a loud 3-2-1 countdown. Emphasize that the countdown needs to be loud enough for the timers on the track to hear. The lane boss needs to observe the vehicle as it travels down the track. There are several items that need to be recorded on the team checklist for each of the two runs. Again, the lane boss needs to know the rules and use the team checklist to record any violations. Let's cover timing the run. An electronic timing system is always recommended. If you don't have an electronic timing system, then I recommend a laser pointing method described on the Science Olympia website. You will find several diagrams and pictures showing how to construct a laser pointing system. Let's cover how to time the vehicle. The time starts when the vehicle's dial rod reaches the half meter timing line. This is where the laser pointer helps because the timing people will see a flash when the dial rod breaks the laser beam. The time stops when the dial rod reaches the second timing line at 8.5 meters. Again, you will see the flash of the dial rod break the laser beam. This is an easy one everyone understands. Let's cover some different scenarios. The vehicle starts, but does not cross the half meter line. Because the vehicle never reached the first timing line, there is no time, which makes this a failed run. The next one, the vehicle starts, but does not cross the 8.5 meter line. This requires manual timers. The time starts at the half meter line, and the time stops when the vehicle comes to a stop, and a complete stop. If the vehicle reverses direction after stopping, then the time continues to run. The vehicle must come to a complete stop. In the last scenario, the vehicle hits the bucket or the timing gate. The time starts at the half meter line and stops when the vehicle stops. The run time always starts at the half meter line and stops when the vehicle crosses the 8.5 meter line or the vehicle comes to a stop. Now that the vehicle has come to a complete stop, the distance from the terminal barrier needs to be measured. Typically we use a small square to find the tip of the egg and transfer that point to the floor. I recommend always measure the distance on the floor. Don't try and measure the distance in the air. Your measurement method needs to be accurate for all teams. Measuring across the floor will provide a consistent method when teams have the eggs at different heights. A good method to keep the competition moving is to mark the egg location with a square 
or some other method on the floor that does not damage the floor. Once you have the location marked, call the students to retrieve their vehicle. This allows measuring the distance easier because the vehicle is no longer in the way. Remember the eight minute timer is stopped while measuring. The eight minute timer starts when the students pick up their vehicle. Some students will measure and or discuss the next run while standing over their vehicle. In these cases, their eight minute timer starts because this is considered working on their vehicle. Always announce to the students that the eight minute timer has resumed and how much time is left. At the end of any run, the lane boss should inform the students of any violation that occurred before starting their eight minute timer. The goal is to educate the students and this can only be done if they know what the issue is. Plus this points out any difference in opinions on the rules before the second run. If the team had a misunderstanding on the first run, now they have a chance to correct it on the second run. Make sure to record the run results on the team checklist. Record the distance and time for non-failed runs. Record any violations with a no for the correct line. Failed runs do not need any of the other questions answered. Failed runs are one of the few questions that are answered with a yes for the violation. For the yes and no questions, you will see a line that wants the number of no's. Count up the number of no's above the line and put the count here. This is where the questions are asked with a yes if there is no violation. Each no is a violation and the final score can only needs to know the number of penalties. The lane boss is responsible to complete the team checklist before turning it in. Each lane boss should put their initials on the checklist. This makes resolving any issues found later easier. If the team has completed their second run or have finished for some other reason, at this point, the lane boss should go over the scores with the students before they leave the area. Make sure that any violations occurred are known before the team leaves the area. The team must take their device with them when leaving the area, unless there is an issue. Remember, you and your helpers can only talk to the competing students about the rules and or issues during the event. As a general rule, the students are doing the event, not the parents or the coaches. The students need to use their device without help from other students or adults. I encourage the students to ask questions if they are unsure. Only the head coach and the students that compete in the event can talk to you after the students have completed their event. Depending on the issue in the competition, it is your decision to talk to other people. Part of your job as an event supervisor is to educate the students about violations, not just penalize them. If a team wishes to protest a ruling or score, then their device must be put back into impound. This starts what is called arbitration. It means the team and the event supervisor do not agree on how something was handled during the event. By going to arbitration, an independent group will review the issue and the rules to determine its impact. Generally, as an event supervisor, you try and work out issues before going to arbitration. In some cases, I have needed the difference to go to arbitration to get another opinion of a rule. Again, try and avoid arbitration if possible. Remember, the teams are waiting for the final scores and the arbitration process will slow that down. With that said, you want to get the final scores in as quickly as possible. I recommend entering the scores into the event score sheet during the event and not after. The event score sheet can be found on the event page with the team checklist. The spreadsheet was also created by the national group to score the teams correctly and produce the final scores. Tiebreakers are automatically built into the spreadsheet. Before or during the competition, a new event score sheet should be started in Excel. Enter the names of the school on the line with the matching team number. Let's cover how to enter the results from the team checklist to the event score sheet. Taking a closer look at the team checklist, you will find numbers next to some of the result data. These numbers correspond with the columns of the numbers of the event score sheet. For each team checklist, just transfer the result data that have a number to the corresponding row. The final scores will be shown on the right hand side of the spreadsheet as you enter in the scores from the team checklist. The last item we're going to cover here today is a complete checklist for the event. Here you will see a checklist that is all the items that we've discussed on the previous checklist throughout this video. Thank you for watching this video. 
I hope it has helped, and I wish you the best with your event.